Hello, everyone. Uh, despite my uh, delightful Canadian accent, I'm actually with Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO. If you haven't heard about us, you might have used some of the things we developed. Wireless LAN, you might call it Wi-Fi, uh, polymer banknotes, uh, drought-resistant crops, lots of useful things. But I'm not going to take credit for those. I'm here in my capacity as a, CS as a, a cybersecurity researcher. And um, I'm presenting a paper called Hyperlink Hijacking, Exploding Your ODS URLs, Links to Phantom Domains. Now, we've been here, this is a week-long conference. We've seen a lot of formulas. We maybe had a few too many drinks, so I'm going to cut right to the chase. I'm going to take the cognitive load off you and get to the point, which is that hyperlink programming errors can be exploited at scale. That's what we didn't know before. It's what this study has found out. So I'm going to tell you what that means, and I'm going to tell you how we came to that conclusion. Um, but uh, that's the key takeaway, that we can exploit uh, hyperloop programming errors at scale. So I think many of you know that this is what a hyperlink looks like when you do the coding. If you're in HTML, writing HTML code, um, what the user sees on the web page is the underlined bit, gmail.com. And the domain that we're traveling to is, is uh, the bold bit, gmail. In this case, the user, um, or the developer rather, has accidentally typed an extra L. So they've done a little typo. You know, it's common to make a little typo when you're typing in an address. And we might do that when we're visiting our bank website, but then that only affects us. If you make a programming error, it affects everyone that uses your code in perpetuity. So what we're referring to is that this is a hijackable hyperlink because it's pointing to an incorrect location and that traffic can be hijacked. And assuming that Gmail with two Ls.com had never been registered, this would be a phantom domain. So essentially, this is a domain that has active inbound links, but has never been registered. It's available for anyone to come along and, pen, and uh, pay 10 or $20 to hijack the traffic that's pointing into that domain. Um, there's lots of ways that this can be exploited. I'm sure your mind is already sort of picking up on some of them. Uh, a big sort of scary one is using script includes. So it's very common to use JavaScript from another website to drive the functionality of your website. jQuery is used by like three quarters of the websites on the web. So if you make a little oopsie when you type in, you know, your, your boss is shouting at you, push those commits, make a little mistake, and you put in the wrong uh, address, you could be pulling in code from another domain, driving your website with, uh, with uh, code that's, uh, you could maybe up, uh, get up to some, uh, some nasty business. Uh, of course, uh, thanks to the, the prior speaker for pointing out that um, fish, phishing and spoofing are a problem, uh, and also apparently PowerPoint rendering of emoji is a problem because uh, it's, uh, it's doing some strange things. Uh, don't, don't do your presentations on Mac if you're presenting on Windows is, is my takeaway from this lecture. Um, so the, the idea is if you're not really, really astute and paying attention to your URL every page you visit, you may navigate to a page and you may uh, put in a password or some uh, credit card information. But this is just the tip of the iceberg, although it is a really common problem. Um, uh, you can do other things. You can, If you have older browsers particularly, you can deliver malware, you can deliver um, viruses, you can use it for misinformation, for defamation, for uh, uh, any nas any number of things. Uh, so this is why a lot of companies like Google, for example, will have uh, brand uh, protection firms that will buy various variations of their domains. But uh, of course, the landscape of top level domains changes all the time, and it's really hard to keep up with all the, the things that are coming along. Um, so what we wanted to do is find all these phantom domains because we figured, you know, there's probably a lot of developers doing a lot of links. There's probably a lot of errors. So we decided that uh, this could be done as a sampling exercise, but there's some limitations when you sample because if you're looking for stuff that's in the long tail, it's very easy to do a sampling and find all the stuff around the mean, but miss everything that's important. So we realized that uh, although it may not be easy, we should probably look at the whole web. And thankfully the Common Crawl, if you're not familiar with it, has uh, a non-for-profit organization in the US and they're well-funded and they've done a fantastic job of providing these full crawls of the web. So it's pretty much the, the majority, nearly the full surface web um, they provide them on about a monthly basis, and they've been doing this since 2007. Now, the, the downside is this is a lot of data. When I say a lot of data, I mean a lot of data. So in our case, we processed all 104 prior crawls. It, it amounts to about 10 petabytes of data, um, trillions of hyperlinks uh, across hundreds of billions of web pages. So this took, uh, I, I'll, I'll just have a quick brag and say that we've logged more compute jobs than all other staff and students combined at the CSIRO, and uh, the HPC guys know me very well, and not, not necessarily positively. Um, so we also used other data sets. ICANN, they're the people that govern all the domain names. Um, DNS, of course, turns 
domain names into IP addresses. The Internet Archive, I think we all know, keeps archives of old web pages. And we focus primarily on the .com TLD. Uh, there was some uh, vigorous debate with uh, with the reviewers. If you're a reviewer, please make yourself known to me. Uh, your feedback is fantastic. I won't won't be angry. I swear. Um, but uh, we stick with uh, wanting to use .com specifically because if you add up all the other top level domains, uh, adding all of them up, they don't uh, equal as many as there are .coms. And then all the other domains are, um, you know, they have their own sort of access policies. So essentially, what we're dealing with here is a glut of information. We have to filter all that information down to just a list of phantom domains, a short list of these sort of these domains that have active inbound links but were never registered. So what we first do is we crawl, we look across the whole of the common crawl and we make a list of all the domains that have inbound links. And then we start to filter out domains that we know have existed in the past. So if, if a domain was crawled in a previous crawl, we know it existed, so we get rid of it. If uh, the domain was in the zone file, so if this is a registered domain, we get rid of that. And that's the sort of data processing stuff we can do on HPC. And then we can start going to the servers. So DNS's, uh, DNS server records are very, very lightweight. They can be um, queried in, in, in large uh, numbers. And so we then got rid of anything that has a DNS record, because if it has a DNS record, it's a domain that exists. And then we look on the Internet Archive. Uh, even this stage, even on the small data volume, still took a few weeks across many computers. Um, and then at the end, we have a list of phantom domains. And this uh, we went and sort of manually checked and we're, we're quite confident that it's uh, reflective of uh, the actual number of real phantom domains on the web. This is the actual proportions as you whittle down those stages. And you can see that in the end, we found 572,000 phantom.com domains. So it turns out there's a lot of errors being made when people program these websites. So of course, this means that we needed to characterize those errors, which we, uh, we did. We created a taxonomy for doing so. We found there were 17 common error modes. Um, that we use to classify and understand. Um, the bulk of the errors are user contributed data. These are sort of amateur uh, programmers. A lot of them will have blog spots and, and WordPress, but um, that's where you get the volume of the, the hijackable hyperlinks. The real problem is in programming errors. So this is where things become more risky, although there isn't as much of a volume of production of uh, these hijackable hyperlinks. Um, one of the big ones is design templates. So not many people really program or really design their websites uh, that thoroughly. They often will just buy a design template. You know, you don't want to sit down and worry about, you know, all the CSS alignments and things like that. So you just go to one of those websites, buy a template. It turns out that uh, we came across instances where design templates will use things, uh, use placeholder domains. They'll say, you know, when you buy this, update this domain, .com. And so it makes uh, anyone that uses this template spawn on their domain these active inbound links um, to a domain that you can just come along and buy. And it turns out that uh, there are government website templates that are popular that have this. So there's all these governments in the world making these, these links and sort of driving up the page rank of these phantom domains. Um, of course, uh, code generated links is another interesting one. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit towards the end. But uh, we saw some interesting examples of that where you can have these really sort of dangerous links. Um, I mentioned that there are governments that have it, but uh, what I wanted to do is have a way of des describing how pervasive this problem is because I don't want to single anyone out. Um, the best way I could think of describing it is you probably have a logo of a company that's producing these hijackable hyperlinks on you. Because if you think about, you don't have to think very far, you just think of a few financial corporations, you'll find one that has them, news sources, tech companies, major universities. You try three, you'll find one just randomly from our data set. Easy to find. Um, we wanted to make sure that these domains actually do receive more traffic than just a random domain. So we purchased 51 of them, one from each error category, plus a control domain. So just a domain that was randomly purchased. And we found that 88% of them exceeded the traffic of the control domain, and it was up to 10 times more traffic than the control. Um, now, our, our results are slightly polluted um, because we had to... Uh, you know, we had to get ethics approval. The The real uh, test would be to actually try and fish user data, but we've decided not to do that. So I suspect that if we actually did put a page on those uh, on there rather than just a zero length blank page, we'd be seeing even more results. But even this on its own is impressive. Um, now we, of course, don't want to just sort of say there's a problem. We want to present countermeasures. So we, we uh, presented a number of uh, countermeasures along sort of these two axes about uh, mitigation and remediation, internal and external actions. But the main theme here is raised awareness. 
it is not hard to fix this problem. You just have to crawl your page or crawl your site. And if there's any broken links, just fix them. It's not that hard. But I mean, even in GitHub, there are YAML files that'll let, that do this automatically. You don't really even have to do anything. You just have to enable it. But nevertheless, um, it seems to be a pervasive problem, um, probably just because developers are in a bit of a rush. Um, so just to summarize, we found uh, these hijackable hyperlinks on the websites of, uh, of many of the biggest companies around the world. We also found them on, uh, on government websites, as I mentioned before. One interesting one and a stroke of irony is that we found a privacy legislation plugin that had a programming error. This is a GDPR enforcement plugin that is used widely because it's part of content management plugins. Um, and it was, uh, has all these domains all across the web that had a programming error and was spawning these inbound links. So that one was kind of fun to find. Uh, I think that sums it up and uh, thank you for your attention and I'm keen to get some questions.